lot of stuff to get to an hour and a half. Um, so it's really good that I'm from Jersey, so I can speak very, very quickly. Um, I do apologize for that, but there's a lot of stuff I want to get to. Um, I also want to tell you, I want to thank Karen for having me out here. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I've been working with adolescents and adults on the autism spectrum for about 30 years now. Makes me a bit of an outlier in the field. Not because I've been in the field for 30 years, but because I work with adolescents and adults. Everybody who gets into the field gets in the field to work with little kids. And it's really a shame um, because ideally, oh, you forgot your soda. <laughs> ideally, your adulthood is supposed to be the best time of your life. And I really hope for all of you here today that when you're 80s and you're sitting on that park bench, that you're not looking back on your fifth grade birthday party, that you're not looking on on high school graduation. I hope there was more into your life than that. So that's really what we want to talk about today. Um, I am with a group called the Organization for Autism Research. Um, please check out our website. It's on our first, the first slide. You can find it on the handouts when you download them, but it's just www.researchautism.org. Um, we're a, a nonprofit research foundation that basically looks at applied research, intervention research. So check out some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, I am a research person. Um, I follow the research pretty strictly and pretty seriously um, for a number of reasons. One, seeing's not believing. Um, autism is sort of like cancer in the 80s. In, cancer, in, in the 1980s, you had people sort of going to Mexico for laetrile and, and short cartilage and you know, all this stuff that, that there was some hope for, but very little research and very little outcome. Autism is in that same way. We all want the best for your sons and daughters, for our students, for our clients, but seeing really isn't believing. I was in Vegas a couple weeks ago, and I saw Penn and Teller, the comedians and magicians, you know, and they sawed a woman in half, <laughs> like right in front of me. Like, and then the, the top half kept, smoke, kept speaking, and the bottom half of the feet were kicking, and I was like, then they put her back together, and, but I didn't really see that, did I? No, I mean, our eyes are oftentimes not our best judge. Correlation does not mean causation. This is a tough one because we want to believe that if B follows A, A caused B. But it doesn't always work out that way. In New York City, in Manhattan, six years ago, all those little buttons on the street lights that say to cross street, press button, wait for green, they turned them off. Think about it. Do you want pedestrians controlling the flow of traffic in Manhattan? No. They turned off all the buttons. Six years later, you know what? People keep pressing the buttons. And you know why? Because every sixth or seventh time they press the button, what happens? Light turns green, and they think, this one works. OK? You're in a, a conference hotel. I guarantee you go to press, for the, you press the button for the elevator. You wait about 18 seconds, and you do what? You press it again, OK? Even though you know that does nothing, right? But something tells you. And then because you then do it three or four times and it comes by the fifth time you press it, you now think I have to press the button five times because that speeds up the elevator when it has absolutely nothing to do with it. With a population of 300 million people in the United States today, a one in a million occurrence happens to 300 people just by chance. Okay, I appreciate and I accept those stories that I hear from parents and professionals of you know, this bold new intervention that they used that this person now no longer has autism. But get me the data. Now do the research. Because I have an ethical obligation to my clients and my families and my funders and everybody I work with to do stuff that works best. So I have to keep going back to the research to find out what actually works and thereby is able to promote people to have lives of dignity and lives of quality and lives of competence. These are all the free things you can get. Check out our website. That's a little bit out of order, including this little booklet, which you can download for free. Little, it's like 60 pages, but it's all about transitioning everything from college to employment, sexuality, you name it, it's in there. It's free, you can download it, so get it. I am a behavior analyst by training and by practice. And there's just two things I want to point out here that I think sometimes when we think about behavior analysis and older learners, we forget two things. That behavior change needs to be socially important and it needs to be contextual. Let's start with contextual first. We know, as a general rule, that individuals on the spectrum tend not to generalize well. If they learn something in one environment, they don't generally, often generalize it to the next environment very easily. 
right? We know that. So why do we then insist on teaching the beginning of grocery shopping skills in our classrooms instead of just going out to the grocery store to teach with the behaviors most likely to be used? Behavioral maximum number one, teach the behaviors most likely to be displayed. You cannot teach riding the bus in a fake bus. You cannot teach going to McDonald's at the fake McDonald's. You cannot teach, you know, Tiger Woods didn't hit a million imaginary golf balls. You know, he actually went out and played golf and played competitive golf and played at higher and higher levels until he became so confident. Okay, this contextual part is critically important. The second part is we need to look at socially important behavior change. We need to look at behavior change that changes a person's life. Okay, I've been doing this for 30 years. I am very tired of meeting adults with classical autism who can do a math worksheet but can't use a public bathroom. Okay, who can recite the alphabet but can't cross the street safely. Okay, all these, we need to look at, at teaching stuff that actually benefits the person. Because I'll tell you, you know, there are no jobs doing math worksheets. There aren't. Okay, and there are no jobs reciting the alphabet. But there are jobs where you have to use a public bathroom, and there are jobs where you have to get dressed for, and there are jobs that you have to cross the street to get to and navigate your environment safely, and all this sort of stuff. So we need to start looking at skills that really are socially important if we're going to do this. One thing I have highlighted here is we need to sort of revisit this concept of positive reinforcement as it relates to adults. Let me just ask all of you here, don't think too much about this. Okay, just give me your gut response. How many people here think you get enough positive reinforcement in your day-to-day -day lives? Zero. We have like a half of one over here. Like he started to raise his hand and then he put it down. Okay? And what's amazing is you all have the ability to get more reinforcement. You can say, do you like this jacket? Did you like that report I got? You know, honey, we need to talk more. We really need more feedback. Okay, you can get more reinforcement and you don't think you get enough. Now take that kid or adult who can't. Okay? Who either because of their limited communication or limited social skills don't know how to solicit more reinforcement. What's the only way they're going to get any sort of attention? Just by acting out. Okay? A client of mine, 16 years old with Asperger's syndrome, he's the king of video games. He's aces at video games. He will do anything in the world to avoid doing anything but playing video games. And when I asked him why, what was so great about video games, he said it's, it's easier to succeed by not trying than to try and keep failing when it comes to other things in life. When he plays video games, he's the king. He steps out of that room, his handwriting is poor, his grammar is poor, his social skills are poor, his, his adaptive behavior is poor, he's dressing poorly. Like, where would you spend most of your time? Playing video games. Okay? So what we had to do, we had to work with everybody around him to reinforce him just for being a cool kid first. And then sort of build up on these other things step by step so that he could actually start to have the life that he found desirable. I'm going to skip over that one. Two things here, three things here. Behavior analysis represents um, a diverse teaching methodology. It's not just discrete trial. It's not just touch red, touch blue, okay? <clears throat> it's really an amazing science of how to promote skill development in everybody. Now, it has nothing to do with autism. Everybody learns through this process. I have two things here, shaping and chaining. Most people know what shaping is.